I have somebody with me today who I'm so excited to bring you. She was brought to my attention by one of our writers at the National Police Association. So I started to watch her. I started to follow her, see what she's doing. I'm like, wow, I need to meet her. I need to talk to her. And uh, you do too. Officer Mirabelli, welcome to the show. Hi, Betsy. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I am great to have you. I am grateful to have you here. And you're, you have a company called uh, the Never Forgotten Clothing Company, but you do a whole lot more. And first and foremost, you're still on the job. You're on the front lines. You are serving and protecting um, in South Florida. So I'm going to ask you the question I ask every cop that comes on this show. Why'd you become a cop? Well, you know, I grew up and I, we're going to get to talking about it, I'm sure, but I grew up with a police officer as a dad. My dad is still a police officer to this day. I tell him to retire all the time, but he won't. Um, but growing up with a father who was just proud and happy to go to work every day really resonated with me. So watching someone just enjoy their job really inspired me to become a police officer. Um, there was a lack of female representation in policing growing up. And Betsy, that's why you're so important to me, um, first and foremost. But it wasn't until my 20s where I started seeing more representation of women and kind of realizing like, this is something I can do. This is something I can be. Um, and realizing that I had the capabilities to do it. So in 2018, I applied to Chicago Police Department. That's where I lived. It's where I grew up. And I wanted to serve my community. So so first and only police department I uh, applied to. And then I was doing that for the last five years. So I love that because, and you're right. You know, when, when I was a kid growing up in Illinois as well, the only um, female police officers I ever saw were on TV and, yeah. and, and back then in the, in the late seventies, it was, uh, all the police women were undercover hookers and, <laughs> and stuff like that. You didn't yes. really see them on patrol, you know, where they were detectives and they didn't really get to get into the mix when it yep. comes to, uh, physicality, use of force, things like that. And, uh, so you decide. So what I love about you is you uh, you didn't just decide to become a cop. You decided to become a police officer in the second largest city in the nation. Uh, so, wow, that was, you know, I think that Chicago police officers probably see more. I think you saw more in five years than a lot of smaller uh, department police officers really would see in their whole career. Don't you think? What kind of things were you involved in? Yeah. So um, people might say I worked in dog years. Um, my five years, maybe someone's 10 years. Um, I was working on the west side of Chicago, which is um, a very high crime area. And I was working in one of the, I believe it's the top four worst beat in America. Um, I dealt with shootings every week, homicides, and our shot spotter was going off constantly all night long. Um, and yeah, it, it, it definitely grew me as a police officer, as a human being responding to call after call after call. And I also worked at the front lines of the 2020 riots downtown Chicago. Um, I was deployed to a citywide suppression team and worked there. Um, and that taught me a whole lot, uh, really, really fast, uh, especially working in the city of Chicago. You know, during the 2020 riots, here you are, um, much like my daughter, you were raised by a police officer. And uh, and in 2020, we're being told that cops are bad, cops are racist, cops are this, cop, you know, we're white supremacists and this and that. And and I know you were a police officer, but I, I also am guessing you were thinking, wait a minute, I I wasn't raised like that. I didn't hear those things when I was a kid growing up, I wasn't raised by racists and I wasn't raised to become a racist. How talk about what that was like from being a cop's kid point of view. It, it was so hard. And I felt like I had to speak up and use my voice more than just a police officer because my dad provided me with so many opportunities in life and taught me how to be such a good person. And people like you're saying are going around saying that cops are these horrible people. And I know firsthand, you know, that they're not. Um, and it, it was so hard because the evolution of social media is so strong and especially in 2020. 
So, you know, seeing friends of mine, um, that I, you know, thought I had their support posting, you know, horrible things about the career that I love, um, was so hard to see, um, the wave of the hate online just became so much and on the news and it was hard to see. And honestly, that's when I kind of started speaking up more on social media. And that's really how me as like an influencer, I guess, in some sort, I used my platform and my voice to kind of invoke change and kind of speak out on our side as a police officer and as a cop's kid. It was hard. It was definitely hard to see. You know, talk about that, that evolution of social media. And, you know, one of the things that we've seen uh, really since 2014, but uh, it's kind of been ramped up since 2020 is cops getting in trouble for what they say on social media. So talk about that evolution and tell people how you balance that and stay within policy. Yeah, it's it's so incredibly hard. So um, like you said, I work for a South Florida agency, but I worked for Chicago police for five years. Um, in Chicago, they were really supportive of me um, posting how much I love my job and encouraging, you know, women and other people to join the police force. Um, and I believe that they feel the same in South Florida. However, um, they do expect me to keep my agency private and things like that, which I totally respect. Um, however, I see other police departments utilizing their officers who have a voice. Um, and, and it really helps their recruitment as well, because there's a lot of times where people are thinking of becoming a police officer, like my story as well, and they don't see that representation. They don't see people just like me and you humanizing that badge, and, and they don't know that they could become a police officer too. I was actually just talking to someone yesterday who does recruitment for their agency, and they're a first-generation police officer. And just talking about that it would encourage so many others to join the force. So I think social media can be a really great tool for agencies, but I do understand that some agencies um, are worried about what we say because we are under you know, a microscope in the media and everything we say can and will be held against us. So it definitely goes both ways. Yeah, ab absolutely. That's very well said. Now you're a, you're a real upbeat, optimistic person. You, you know, yeah. obviously, you know, that's, that's part of, and that's why I think people should follow you because you're, you're, you're not, uh, um, you're not somebody who's like, oh, people suck. The world sucks. This job sucks. You know, you're actually very, very upbeat, very optimistic. And, uh, but you've seen some bad things and, and how do you, you know, talk about some of those bad things and how you deal with it and balance that in your life. Because one of the one of the main things that we all know about the Chicago Police Department in general is they have suffered some horrible mental health crises uh, within their own agency. Talk about how you dealt with that. Yeah. So the first thing that comes to mind for me is a former partner of mine that summer of 2020 was Ella French, Officer Ella French, who was tragically killed in the line of duty August 7th, um, 2021. She was one of my very best friends. Mm -hmm. And honestly, she is one of the reasons that I do what I do today and speak out on stories um, because there is a lot of tragedy. There is a lot of <laughs> realities on this job that are not positive. But what we can do and what we have the opportunity to do, like what we just talked about, even on social media, is to humanize these people. So when I share Ella's story, I don't want them to just see that photo of her in a uniform. I want them to know the girl that I knew. And she's a sister, she's a cousin, she's a friend, and she looks just like us, which is so wild, um, which is why my platform gives voices to other officers who want to share their stories. Because... I am optimistic and I am happy. And, and, and it does get me in a lot of trouble. Sometimes people say, there's no way you're that happy. There's no way you love your job, but you know what? I take these stories and these bad things that are happening, bring them light and encourage other officers to do the same, because if we don't share their stories, who will? And if we don't share the stories of how we came from the trenches, you know, and brought ourselves up or encouraged others to, you know, come up on their own as well, then we're not going to get anywhere. So we have to be positive. We have to be kind and we have to use our voices, speak up and share stories. 
You know, as someone who uh, looked into the faces of street gang members every single yep. day on the job, and and again, for people who don't know, this, Chicago has had a street gang problem for the last forty plus years, and uh, and in this country, we right now we have thirty two thousand different identified street gangs around this nation, and a lot of them are in the city of Chicago. And there's a lot of people who say, oh, it, it, you know, people need this and that. They all have these solutions. Give me your, you know, one minute having stared it in the face solution yeah. to our street gang problem. Well, because I'm a boots on the ground cop and I was a community officer in Chicago, I walked the block. And I think it's so important to just like walk the blocks. Um, instead of like staying away from where the gangs are at, let's get in there. Let's let's tackle these problems head on. Let's our presence alone can solve so many active crimes, right? So when we have those foot patrols, um, when we go up and down the block meeting families, you know, and a lot of these families are struggling, you know, they don't want their son in a gang, you know, but they're working 24 seven. So they're absent from the home. So what can we put in schools that have after school programs instead of letting them go home and run around with no one home? So it, it goes from the schools and it goes from just like face to face. Um, being that officer, I was a dare officer as well. So I was in the schools teaching dare and I did teach gang members. Um, also I taught great, which is the gang retention, um, and education and training program. And just getting in there with these students who are thinking of joining a, a gang or their parents are in a gang or whatever, talking to them face to face, telling them that there's more to life than this, encouraging them and showing them that the police aren't so bad because they can put a face to a name is so important. So I really just think face value is just like getting in there, walking the block, meeting the families, telling them that there's help available and getting your officers into schools. And didn't you find, because I don't think a lot of people know this, that most of the people in the neighborhoods that you dealt with were happy to see you, wanted yes. you in their neighborhoods. You know, talk about that for me, because I think people are so surprised to hear about that. And and I had found this in the city of Chicago for decades when I, when I would go there and do some of the other work I did. Um, gosh, there would be prayer rallies for Chicago yes. police officers. And there would be, you know, the community loves the Chicago police department, don't they? Yes. Um, you know, when I came to Florida, now I'm an officer in South Florida, everyone said, you know, oh my God, you must be appreciated by the community so much more in Florida. And, and that might be true in some avenues, right? But when I did go face to face with these families, walk the blocks, the thank yous were overwhelming because there is a lack of presence in, in these high crime, you know, priority areas. Um, I would, they'd grab my hands and say, thank you so much for being here. Or just my presence alone, they'd tell me, oh, you know, I need help with my son. What can I do? What resources do you have? And to have those community officers have those resources on hand that we can give to these families is so, so important. But yes, so many people were so thankful to just have us there, have us show up at a, you know, a church ceremony, have us show up at a school, a neighborhood event, a backpack giveaway, anything. It is so important to show your presence in the community, especially in those areas. Absolutely. They were thankful. You know, you were there at the uh, kind of at the beginning of the migrant crisis, you started to see the open borders and, and what kind of impact did that have on your community? It was hard. So in my station alone, we had, I believe at one point, 120 people sleeping on the floor of our, of our front lobby. Um, and I want to, I want to emphasize that because I don't think people around the country really know that the migrants yeah. in the city of Chicago were literally living in district stations, correct? Correct. They were living and we'd send like shower trucks like once a week. Um, and I will tell you that being a community outreach officer at that time, um, I was in the station in and out in the station a lot. Um, and I couldn't just be in my car 24 seven working patrol. So I had, you know, I had a lot of interaction and I, you know, we weren't prepared for what was about to come. And we didn't know that we would be a home for migrants. We had no idea. And I know that my supervisors really struggled with it as well. Um, 
there was a lot uh, going on at that time. And the community was, I guess what I would say is they were, they were nervous. Um, they didn't know where these people would be placed, um, what this would mean for their children. Um, and I think everyone, including the officers, were all really confused as to like, what's next, you know, and, and what's, what is the plan? Because it felt like there was no plan. I also think, you know, when they came into our stations and slept, we didn't, um, we weren't really required to get like identification from them, which I think could have been a really useful tool to get like fingerprints or identification from these people, because we don't know who they are and who we're releasing in, into our streets, you know, and into our communities. Um, so yeah, it, it still, I think is kind of a mess and we don't really know where to go from here. And I'm sure that the migrants felt the same. They don't, they didn't know that they'd be sleeping on a floor in a police station either. So it's all around um, confusing for everybody involved. You know, and I, and I have talked, I have talked to so many Chicago police officers who were literally bringing in their own kids clothing, you know, their hand-me-down. Oh yeah. They're bringing food, they're bringing Tylenol. And I mean, just, it, it was the the outpouring of compassion yes. by Chicago police officers and their families was extraordinary. We fed so many. We would get pizzas, you know. We would get clothes, blankets. We'd have newborn babies crying in our department. We would hold them, feed them, and that was a lot of the things like the news didn't talk about. But we we really were right there. I mean, you can't deny it. You can't just walk over people and walk out. So we would help you know, as much as we could, um, they were right there. We hadn't, we had no choice and we wanted to help because like I said, we were all confused, all of us alike. We didn't know what was going on. Absolutely. So you, what led you to the difficult decision to leave the city of Chicago and leave the state of Illinois and, and go to South Florida? Cause every, everybody talks about it. It's not easy to leave your home and your home police department and go somewhere else. Yeah, it was the hardest decision I ever had to make. Um, but the lateral transfer process was really easy. Florida truly in my department really rolled out the red carpet for me. They were super accommodating, respectful and kind and you know, respecting my time so I didn't have to fly out a hundred times to take the exams and things like that. But the ultimate decision actually came because um, I was, long story short, I was in Washington, D.C. for Police Week. And if you don't know about Police Week, you meet a lot of other officers from around the country. And that's actually where I met my fiance, who is a police officer in Florida. So um, we met there. We did long distance and we had to decide where are we going to live, Chicago or Florida? And he's a police officer as well. And I think the easy decision for me was to move to Florida, become a police officer in Florida. Um, like I said, it was a really hard decision to make to leave my family, leave my community, leave my coworkers, my friends. Um, but it's been a year now and it's been such a great decision. I don't regret it at all. Um, the community, the support I have here is incredible. Um, and I'm loving being an officer in Florida. Well, and let me just remind people that the weather in Chicago is terrible about 80% of the time. So yes, <laughs> yes, I haven't had to shovel any snow or, you know, scrape my squad cars windshield off. So that has been great alone. <laughs> I think that's, uh, I think that's one of the main reasons and for people who have never patrolled in 40 below windshield oh. on the lake, uh, really have no idea what I haven't had to frozen toes, literally standing outside. Oh my gosh. Exactly. So I want to talk about Never Forgotten Clothing Company, where that came from and and what are your your hopes uh, for that uh, going forward, you know, and, and, and wrapping it up with the social media. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it started as a clothing company because uh, as a police officer, I would buy clothes online and it would look just like my boyfriend's clothes and already have three options. So I really wanted to make clothing for first responders that had that feminine touch to it. I also make men's clothing. Um, but what really started as a clothing company has turned into a community. So while I had that platform, I used it to share stories. And first and foremost, I used it to share 
Officer Ella French's story, and so many people reached out to me to share their stories. So it's really become a platform for advocacy for uh, Police Lives Matter and for Back the Blue, Humanize the Badge, and all things of the sort. Um, and then it's turned into an open forum where we discuss, lend advice, things like that. And then now it's also turned into a podcast. I have my own podcast called the Five O Podcast with three O's. And those people that I've met through these connections, I, I talk to them and interview them and give them a voice. Like I've interviewed officers who have been shot in the line of duty or lost, you know, a family member in the line of duty or, you know, have a story to share. And I believe that those stories should be shared. So now it's just truly a community and all the clothes that I sell give a dedicated donation. So whether it's to a family who's lost someone or a nonprofit organization that raises money for fallen officers and their families, every purchase makes a dedicated donation. And that's at the forefront of everything is to raise money for families. Talk about where people can find you, where they, where can they find the podcast, your social media, the clothing, every, give us, give us all of it. <laughs> so the main hub would be my Instagram. It's at never period forgotten period co. And there has links for everything to um, my podcast, to my um, TikTok. Um, my TikTok is at that officer. Hey, and then my podcast is the five O O O H explanation mark podcast. But again, you can find that all on my Instagram. It's all there for you at the never forgotten co. I'll tell you that the the amazing officer Mirabelli, you you are just an inspiration. You are uh, my little sister. You are incredible. I want everyone to get to know you, and I cannot thank you enough for spending time with us today. And if you would like more information about the National Police Association, visit us at nationalpolice.org. Join the National Police Association in supporting our brave men and women in blue. Every day they put their lives on the line to keep us safe. But they need our help to continue their mission. Black Lives Matter, Antifa, progressive prosecutors, and the rest of the anti-police forces receive millions in donations from extremists like George Soros and woke companies like Amazon, Coca-Cola, Microsoft, and Google, to name a few. The National Police Association is fighting them in courts around the country, including the United States Supreme Court, defending officers who are being attacked for doing their jobs. Additionally, the National Police Association works year-round to pass tough-on-crime legislation to put and keep criminals behind bars. Consider going to nationalpolice.org and donating just $5 to keep us in the fight. Together, we can win. That is National